Brother, Where Art Thou? Written by Butterfly Coffee and Mr. Dodge. Read and adapted for audio by TARDIS9. The Fat Controller had found himself very busy. The big engines could often see him at stations and by the line side. He was always with a big group of people in bright orange jackets. They would say, Yes, this is good, or No, that won't do. It was some time before the engines finally understood what was going on. The Fat Controller came to see them at the sheds. It is my pleasure, he said, to tell you all that the Flying Scotsman is visiting us for a few days. Gordon was ecstatic. Oh, hooray, he cheered. Oh, how wonderful. I thought you may be pleased at the news, <laughs> chuckled the Fat Controller. He'll be here tomorrow, so you must all make him feel welcome. And he left the sheds. The HST sisters Pippa and Emma were staying at the sheds. Who is the Flying Scotsman again? They asked innocently. My brother, of course, boomed Gordon. He tried not to sound hurt. He's world famous, you know. He's been to America and all that. And he was the first engine to officially reach 100 miles an hour. The other engines groaned. Oh, here we go, sighed Henry. Uh, he'll be at it all night, grumbled James. Hey, just be glad Doc isn't here, muttered Donald. He'd be talking more than Yod and Gordon. Gordon was at it all night. When he'd bored the others to sleep, he chattered to himself before tiring himself out too. Gordon woke up very early the next morning and asked his driver to take him to the station. He wanted to be the first engine to welcome Scotsman. When he got there, Gordon found Timmouth Station packed with people. A fence had been put up and they all had big cameras. Every now and again, he heard a few members of the crowd say, Look, Scotsman's early! Or, Since when did they paint Scotsman blue? Well, famous, <laughs> Gordon thought proudly. Then he heard a faraway raspy whistle. The crowd suddenly came to, straining against the fencing. Flying Scotsman finally glided in, making a horrible clanking noise. The arrival was met by a rush of clamouring and camera clicks. Men in orange jackets rushed to keep them at bay. Gordon tried to call out, but Scotsman didn't hear. He looked nervously at the station. The big engine was uncoupled and he scuffled away. Gordon found the entire thing very strange indeed. The blue engine found Scotsman in the yards. He looked very different. His paint was a much darker green, he had one tender, and he looked as though he had blinkers on his smoke box. The biggest difference, however, was that Scotsman looked tired and unhappy. Gordon was immediately concerned. Brother? Scotsman jumped. <gasps> then he saw who called him. Oh, oh, Gordon, he said relieved. Oh, it's you. He took a brief moment to calm himself. <laughs> it's been far too long. Indeed, rumbled Gordon. How have you been? You certainly look... He trailed off. He trailed off. Well, uh... Old and worn? Asked Scotsman. I feel it, dear brother. Time has not been good to me. Whatever happened? Asked Gordon, dismayed. Scotsman told Gordon all about his journey to America and how his owner had to leave him behind. Then he explained how someone else brought him home to England and how he ran in Australia. Australia? said Gordon, astonished. <laughs> Indeed, Scotsman chuckled, a genuine smile coming to his face. 
442 miles. <laughs> it made King's Cross to Edinburgh look like a shunting manoeuvre. His smile faded. <sighs> Things were rather rocky after that, he continued. I was sold and bought again. Being somewhat run down, I went into a works for repairs. I did a little more work after I was mended, but was sold again, this time to the National Collection. Why so many owners? asked Gordon. They said they kept losing money, replied Scotsman sadly. They wouldn't say much after that. After I went into the collection, I still felt ill. I did tell them I couldn't run, but they made me all the same. I went into the works again and was stuck there for ten years. Gordon was shocked. Ten years? He spluttered. But, but, but whatever for? The men kept finding things wrong, Scotsman said. And they kept saying they had to raise more money to mend me. So I waited and waited. At last someone offered to mend my parts. So I waited some more until they were finished. And now you're steaming again, finished Gordon grandly. Fit as a fiddle. Scotsman looked from side to side, as though he were afraid of being heard. I'm afraid not, Gordon, he whispered morosely. I have good days and bad days, but I still feel ill much of the time. I don't steam well, but no one seems to care because of my fame. And now even that is a problem. How on earth so? People badly want to see me. First they want me out of my nice apple green, and then with these ghastly smoke deflectors. And now they go as far as to trespass just to catch a glimpse of me. Poor Scotsman looked more tired and worried. I had hoped I could lose the crowds on Sodor, but it seems not. The big green engine looked sadly at his brother. I fear I may have brought trouble with me, Gordon. Well, please forgive me. Gordon had no chance to say anything. His first train was due. As his driver took him away, Gordon was left to take everything in, and Flying Scotsman was back on his own. The next day, Scotsman was put on Gordon's express trains. Gordon, for once, didn't mind. He gladly blessed Scotsman with dry rails and good running. Things went well at first, Flying Scotsman made the first round trip safely and without mishap. He was starting to feel like his old self again. <laughs> oh, pity I can't see much of the line, he thought. I'd forgotten how beautiful Sodor was. But all this quickly changed. Now that his followers knew where Scotsman would run, they began to stake out at stations and different parts of the main line. They crowded the edge of the platforms and got in the passengers' way. The flash of their cameras spoiled the view of the countryside, and their calling for Scotsmen to look at them drowned out station announcements. It seemed the further he went along, the closer people got to the line side. This was putting an already irritated Scotsman on edge. Then it happened. As the big engine rounded the bend towards Edward's station, he saw someone lay down on the line with a phone in hand. No, 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 cried Scotsman in horror. His driver went to brake, but someone in the crowd pulled the man away just in time. Scotsman clanked to a stop with inches to spare, steam going in all directions. As the steam cleared, he looked down to where the man would have been. He was nowhere to be seen. Scotsman made his way up the hill, aghast and shaken. The train otherwise made it safely to Cronk. 
Flying Scotsman hoped for a chance to catch his breath here, but an angry voice stopped him. It was the same man from earlier. You're not smiling for my picture, he complained. He stepped back with his phone held up. Let's do it again. Scotsman saw red. I ruined your picture, did I? He blustered. Look here, sir. You were lying down on the line in front of me. I could have hit you. Not only that, I could have killed you, sir. The man dropped his phone from his face. Scotsman was trembling with rage. I could have killed you, sir, he said again. I'm over a hundred tons of steam and metal, and yet you will insist on trying to put yourself in my path. For what? For the sake of a still image? There's hardly anything to smile about. Why? Why do people always insist on sitting in the middle of a track as a speed limit of 75 miles an hour just for the sake of a photograph? The man paused for the smallest of moments. Then he shrugged. Well, <laughs> no one's been hurt yet, have they? Scotsman went cold. Gordon was appalled when he found out what had happened. The shame of it! The shame of it! I quite agree said the fat controller grimly. Rest assured, I shall not tolerate that kind of behaviour. He'll be investigated for his trespass. Gordon was far more worried about Scotsman. He couldn't bear the thought of his poor brother having to face those crowds alone. Please, sir, he said. May I run the express with Scotsman tomorrow? The passengers would be excited to see two famous engines. The fat controller thought it was a grand idea and went back to his office to make the arrangements. Gordon was pleased but pensive. I hope that can keep these... I hope that can keep those hooligans at bay, he wished. He silently moved off for his next train. I refuse, said Scotsman the next morning. I beg your pardon. I'm sorry, Gordon, but after yesterday, I'm not going to put you through what I go through every time I take a rail tour. We surely wouldn't get close to the two of us, brother. <laughs> Besides, if they tried anything, I'd give them a good scolding. <laughs> that would teach them. Flying Scotsman laughed bitterly. <laughs> that sort of bravado won't help us now. <laughs> Those people are vultures, Gordon. They follow me wherever I go and endanger themselves and me at every turn. There's nothing you, your controller or any fool can say that will make me go out there again. I put enough people at risk. Scotsman, please. No! Flying Scotsman thundered. I've had it. No more. I'm not going to be paraded around like someone's money bag, and that is final! Suddenly, a thunderous roar of smoke and steam erupted from Scotsman's cab. Gordon hacked and choked, horrified and dismayed. Scotsman's crew ran frantically this way and that to bring the big engine under control. Steam continued to billow from his cab, making an awful noise. It took a long time for the men to inspect the damage. The fat controller and the men in the orange jackets watched closely. The prognosis was not good. One of the boiler smiths said at last, His flue tubes have gone. He's going to need a full retube. <sighs> Goodness me, sighed the fat controller. We'll get Scotsman over to Corvin's gate and... No, you won't, said one of the jacketed men. Scotsman is the people's engine and belongs to the NRM. Any repair and contract work is to be done by our works back in Lancashire. We're going to arrange for Scotsman to be towed home the next day. The fat controller tried to convince them otherwise, but there was nothing he could do. Once Scotsman had stopped hissing, he and Gordon were left alone. The silence was deafening between the two big engines. The next morning... 
Some diesels with the train Scotsman had brought were sat outside the sheds and ready to go. It was now that Scotsman broke his vow of silence. It's a curse, you know, Gordon. His voice was quiet and reserved. He didn't look at the blue engine, just a few spots of ballast between the rails. Gordon jumped. What? I still remember the days when I used to travel, not just across the oceans, but around the country. I might have been mainline bound for a lot of the time, but there was variety in where I went. <laughs> I miss seeing a lot of my friends from the old days. Now I have to stick strictly to certain locations, the places I do go I'm well and truly out of public view. Gone are the days when you could just simply chat the day away. And the only times you do see the public are when they are risking their own lives to see you. Gordon was a little shaken. How could Scotsmen have changed so much over the years? Well, you've, you've got people who look after you. People who pay to overhaul and repair you. Surely all that has to be worth something. Scotsman looked vacant. I'm back in this hideous shape, Gordon. I thought the days of me looking like this were nothing but a blip in my career. I'm tired. I'm ill. And people still insist on trespassing. And all for the sake of a photograph. Take my advice, Gordon. Don't become famous. But dear brother, I am. For the first time that morning, Scotsman looked his brother coldly in the eyes. Then you're as damned as I am. Gordon was speechless. Every time he tried, it felt like a lump had formed in his throat plate. Even as the diesel came to take Scotsman away, he didn't say anything. Now Gordon was all alone. He felt very, very small. Scotsman was long out of sight when Edward backed down in the berth next to Gordon. Afternoon, Gordon. How are you? You. The old engine took a good long look at the bigger engine. Gordon was absolutely devastated. Are you alright? Gordon explained all that had happened over the past few days. And then he said, Then you're as damned as I am, he finished mournfully. I see, Edward said quietly. He chose his next words carefully. <sighs> From what you've told me, it almost sounds like your brother has depression, Gordon. Depression? Gordon looked off into the distance. My own brother? Edward was solemn. Well, I'm certain your brother loves you. He's had to deal with this sort of stress for years at a time. Yesterday sounds like it was the breaking point. While his words were emotionally charged, I believe they weren't genuine. I'm sure one day, when he comes back, you two can try to make amends. Gordon continued to stare forlornly into the horizon. For his and Flying Scotsman's sakes, I hope Edward is right. Don't you? Thank you.